Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and our Lord, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Mark, and I'm so happy that you've decided to spend some time with the faith community here at First United Methodist Church of Santa Barbara uh, as we worship God together today. We are a reconciling congregation, which means that we invite people of every race, background, sexual orientation, or gender identity to join us on this faith journey as we strive toward living more fully Christ's message of love. Today, we're grateful to have a a message from our guest preacher, the Reverend Dr. Mary Dennis, who is the North District Change Manager. And uh, we look forward to the words that she shares with us. I know you're going to appreciate um, her timely message this morning. So thank you to Mary. And since you're watching this on YouTube, I thought I'd make a few suggestions. Um, One is that if you have a smart TV, you can actually go to the apps on the TV and uh, get into YouTube, look up the church, and you can watch uh, the worship service on a bigger screen, perhaps, um, than you have typically. Uh, also, just to mention that you can click and sh- click on the share button and you can share our worship service with your friends and family um, through Facebook or through an email that you send to them. Uh, and there's some other uh, options there as well. And finally, if you would hit the subscribe button, um, that supports our church channel Uh, just in terms of the viewership and um, getting the the word out there. So all of these are ways that you can participate this morning. I pray that God will richly bless us as we worship together, as we look to the word of life to speak grace and truth into our lives today. Would you pray with me, please? O God, source of all beauty and goodness, your grace comes fresh every morning. In each new day, you give us light, We praise you for your never-failing love that satisfies our needs and shows us the way to follow. We rejoice in your constant care, for you are faithful in love for all people, offering your salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Steadfast God, you reach out to us in mercy, even when we rebel against your holy call and prefer to walk in disobedience, rather in the way of your divine truth. Soften our hearts with the warmth of your love, that we may know your Son alive within us, redeeming us and raising us up into your eternal presence. Amen. The reading of the scripture for today comes from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Listen, let us listen for the word of God. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And now I will be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning. I'm Reverend Mary Dennis, and I'm so pleased to be with you this morning to bring the message. So let us begin. Early on in my years of parish ministry, a dear saint of the church and fellow deacon, Reverend Dr. Ruth Bell, trained and mentored me to facilitate cancer support groups. Ruth had a PhD in psychiatric nursing, and she led a cancer support group at my home church. At that time, my clergy appointment was 10 miles down the road in an area that was considered to be a cancer hotspot. Preparing me to facilitate a group there was born out of her desire to ensure a compassionate outreach to cancer patients and their loved ones that lived closer to Washington, D.C. So I partnered with the parish nurse, and together we led this new support and recovery group at church. Several parishioners joined right away, but news spread like wildfire, and before we knew it, we had 10 to 12 people attending each time that we met. It became a strong, cohesive group in just one year. And that's about when a woman I'll call Mara arrived. Mara is the Hebrew word for bitter. I chose it for her today for confidentiality purposes, but also because even though anger is a well-known stage of grief, anger and bitterness was all this woman expressed in her time with us. There was no movement toward acceptance with her at all. Now believe me when I say that receiving a cancer diagnosis is life-shattering even for even the strongest among us. Some of you watching today know just what I mean. Living with cancer is a difficult undertaking requiring strong support. And it seemed that Mara had no one but us to support her. She was in her 60s, 
Her parents had already died. She had no siblings. Mara never married, and she had no children. So we understood where this bitterness was coming from. Being a church-sponsored cancer support group, we prayed at meetings and we talked about that journey of, of faith and where cancer and faith intersected. And our participants talked openly about when they felt close to God and when they felt abandoned and alone. That was all par for the course for us. But after a few months, with Mara in the group, as her health began to fail, it became clear to us that her treatment was not working. At that time, she admitted being angry at God. She wasn't sure if she believed that he answers prayers or cares about individual people's concerns. But the thing that she was most afraid of was that she didn't know what would happen to her when she died. It became clear to me that I had to do some spiritual triage with Mara, and soon because of her failing health. Well, she entered hospice care, and I visited her so we could talk about faith and God's love for her. I shared the 23rd Psalm with her, stopping at each sentence to explain what it meant. I focused on how our Lord grants us rest, restores our souls, leads us through the darkest valleys while protecting and comforting us, how Christ prepares a place for us where we can receive his goodness and mercy and dwell with him forever. And that his love and grace is a gift offered to us by God. Then I asked, will you receive it? With tears in her eyes and relief on her face, she bowed her head and gently whispered, yes. And she smiled. Friends, up until that point, I had never seen Mara smile. And in an instant, her bitterness dissolved into a beautiful expression of contentment and peace. I anointed her head with oil. I prayed the Lord's Prayer with her, then read John 14, those first three verses you just heard. Then I kissed her forehead and said my final goodbye. Mara passed away peacefully early the next morning. Now, I'm not sharing this story to call attention to me or my ministry. I'm sharing it because God is the one who saved this woman through his mercy and grace. I was merely a conduit for Christ. Now, earlier that day, the Holy Spirit prompted me to focus on the 23rd Psalm with Mara, and for my part, I was being attentive and obedient to God's call until Jesus took the wheel. So I prayed, I sang, and I shared scripture with Mara, knowing that I can't save her. But God, who is rich in mercy, made her alive with Christ, even when she felt dead in her transgressions. For it is by grace that Mara and you and I are being and have been saved. Friends, the good news of Jesus Christ can be captured in two small words, but God. We were stuck in our sin, but God. We wondered if life was worthwhile, but God. Our lives were empty, but God. We felt unloved, but God. We experienced injustice, but God. We were belittled because of our choices, our beliefs, or our race, but God. We were raised to think less of people who didn't look or act like us, but God. You get my point. No matter what you're facing today, no matter how overwhelming it may seem, hear again the good news for you, but God. Our lesson from Ephesians begins with the bad news of our condition outside of Christ. We've seen that we were in bondage to sin, Satan, and the God-opposing powers of the world. To sum up today's lesson, we were dead. We were walking dead. Yet that's not the end of the story. 
Rather, it's just the beginning of the story of God's love and grace, of God saving us from our deathly condition and meaningless lives. But God comes into our lives to make a way when there's no way. God comes into our lives because there's still more for us to learn and do and say. So no matter what you are struggling with right now, no matter how insurmountable it all may seem, no matter how much you may have brought it on yourself, hear again the good news for you. But God. Friends, I don't need to tell you that we're living in a turbulent time unprecedented even. In recent months, many have described it as living with two deadly pandemics, one due to coronavirus, the other due to racism. We are a nation in mourning, in need of comfort and healing. This virus has shined a light on the disproportionate number of people of color contracting and dying from COVID-19 due in part to lack of preventive medical care and poor living conditions. Breonna Taylor and George Floyd's deaths have exposed disparities in the treatment of people of color by law enforcement and our courts based on policies that discriminate and create systems like the school-to-prison pipeline. Recently, we've witnessed increasing support for the Black Lives Matter movement, leading hundreds of thousands of people of all races and ethnicities to gather together throughout this country and the world to stand up for racial equality and justice for all. We've been asked to listen and learn, to evaluate our beliefs regarding race, and to try to do better in our interactions with others particularly people of color. We've also been asked to become allies and advocates for justice. Now, I don't know about you, but I've received so many mixed messages from my parents, friends, bosses, teachers, coworkers, that I've spent much of my adult life sorting out the lies and falsehoods so that I can hold on to the truth. Now I can wholeheartedly claim, believe, and accept that we are all God's children, made in his image to flourish in this life and join him in the next. And even though I consider myself to have arrived at a place where I can confidently say that I am not a racist, I still acknowledge that deep down some racist thoughts rear their ugly heads from time to time quite unexpectedly. So in my effort to do better, I decided to purchase and read How to Be an Anti-Racist by Abram X. Kendi. Incidentally, my local church selected the book for the book study, and I joined the group. When we started, I didn't know the difference between being not a racist and being anti-racist. But now I do. Now, I'm not going to summarize its contents here, but I will reflect on a few things the author shares. Still, I do recommend that you read it for yourself. Kendi is an academic, and for this book, he digs deeply into his subject and offers concrete suggestions on how to break racial barriers once and for all. However, the thing that fascinated me most was the author's willingness to be completely vulnerable and transparent about his personal transformation from having racist thoughts to becoming an anti-racist. By the way, Kendi is black. He grew up hearing so many racist statements that he internalized some of them and came to believe and espouse them for a time. Now, Kendi's personal transformation in thinking is not unlike my own and possibly yours. Important influences were his family, his church, experiences with friends, and getting to know people who are racially and ethnically diverse. Then while in college, and later while doing postgraduate studies, he became familiar with research about race and poverty and policies affecting incarceration, housing, and public health. All of these experiences and, and studies informed his thoughts on race. 
And writing the book wasn't just an intellectual exercise for Kendi. He experienced racism throughout his life. So he made it his life's work to call attention to racist thinking and policies that perpetuate injustice against people of color so that we, you and I, can join together to help dismantle it. So now this is your spoiler alert. In the last few pages, Kendi shares that he was diagnosed with and treated with stage four colon cancer, one with only a 12% survival rate. In his case, after six months of chemotherapy and surgery, the cancer is now in remission. Surviving this life-threatening experience led Candy to think of racism as a cancer, one of the fastest spreading and most fatal cancers humanity has ever known. He asks, what if we treated racism the way that we treat cancer? He goes on to wonder what would happen if we saturated politics with the chemotherapy and immunotherapy of anti-racist policies that shrink the tumors of racial inequities and kill undetectable cancer cells. Then remove any remaining racist policies, the way that surgeons remove tumors. Could this be the key to dismantling racism once and for all? That is his hope and prayer. Then Kendi writes, before we can treat it, we must believe. Believe all is not lost for you and me and our society. Believe in the possibility that we can strive to be anti-racist from this day forward. Believe in the possibility that we can transform our societies to be anti-racist from this day forward. For racist power is not godly. Racist policies are not indestructible. Racial inequities are not inevitable. And racist ideas are not natural to the human mind. This is so true. Notice here and with Mara that beliefs always precede action. So if this is one of the things that you, like I, sometimes struggle with, then remember that God, who is rich in mercy, forgives our past and puts us in right relationship with him and with others by his transforming grace. And just like anything we want to improve or change, we start by examining ourselves in order to identify old soul-destroying ways of thinking and self-destructive patterns of behavior so that we can be and do better. Friends, no matter what we do, we cannot exhaust God's grace for us in Christ. Christian humorist Anne Lamott calls grace our spiritual WD-40. It keeps us connected with Christ, moving forward, and going strong. So those times when we just can't get ourselves back on track or out of the messes we've made or move forward after a setback, Hear again the good news for us. Maybe we can't, but God can. Our God makes us alive in Christ, and God saves, transforms, and guides us so that we can truly be better. For our part, we must believe this. It's beliefs like these that lead to personal and spiritual transformation. And who doesn't want that? Amen? So my challenge this week is for you to consider in what ways have you already experienced the but-God nature of God's grace? And where do you need God's grace today? Once you know that, then pray for it, and it will be given unto you. How's that for good news? Will you pray with me now? Gracious God, Indeed, it is true. Your grace can be summarized in two simple words, but God. We were stuck in sin and spiritually dead, but you acted to set us free and give us new life. Thank you, dear Lord, for your extravagant love. Thank you for your mercy and grace. And thank you for the example Jesus set 
for how to live. May the good news summarized in But God echo in our hearts today. May it shape our thoughts, emotions, words, and deeds so that we may live as beautiful reflections of your grace today in all that we do. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Join me in prayer on this Labor Day Sunday. God, give us grace to understand how our lives depend on the courage, the industry, the honesty, and the integrity of all who labor, even those who are laboring at home these days. We pray for those who labor so diligently to make our community possible. Teachers, during these pandemic restrictions, those faced with the challenges of virtual education classrooms, sometimes even having to raise their own funds for materials. Our wonderful nurses and doctors on the front lines of medical care for the sick and dying, be with them. Our office staff who keep our computers going and answer daily calls for support and care. Our firefighters who risk personal harm for our safety. Policemen and women on the streets answering our calls to protect and to serve. We pray for mail carriers in these troubled times across our country. We pray for those who do the repair work, the renovations, the maintenance, and the hard physical labor on our behalf. We pray for the craftsman in his studio, creating works of art to uplift and restore our sense of beauty and grace. We pray for composers who hear the music of the spheres in their mind's ear and translate on to a musical score. And we pray for those who share those gifts with us in expressions of instrument and voice that speak to our souls. God, we give you thanks for all who labor. May we be mindful of their needs, grateful for their faithfulness, and faithful in our responsibilities to them. God, on this Labor Day Sunday, we remember those for whom issues of labor are in crisis. Those who look in vain for work that will sustain them and their families above poverty and want. Those victims of the virus who lost jobs, careers, and even loved ones whose work had supported the family. We pray for those who cannot work. We pray for those who labor without hope, for those whose work demands are too crushing to give time for rest and renewal of body and soul. We pray for those who pay unfair wages and for those who trade on the addictions and troubles of others. God, you call us all to productive labor, to employ our gifts and talents for you. Help us to join our resources and commitments to bring relief to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, liberty to the oppressed, until we all share fully in our true vocation to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, praising God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. We pray these things in Jesus' name, whose prayer of discipleship we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In gratitude for the immeasurable gift of Jesus Christ, let us bring our tithes and our offerings to God. We thank every one of you for remembering to send your gifts, either in the mail or online, to 
support the ongoing work of the church as we seek to be a blessing to the community and a guiding light for those who seek to know Christ more fully. Let us offer our prayers now for these gifts. Holy God, use us and these gifts to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and honor your presence in all people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We do doing what we can. We can create the world again, making something to have, having something to make is a mighty good thing for everyone's sake. Makes you feel so good. And now go in peace to love and serve our Lord. And may the grace of Christ surround you, the love of God astound you, and the Holy Spirit keep you, now and forevermore. Amen.